nothing particular. Enjoy fishing or? Oh, I, yes, I like fishing. Uh-huh. Like I, to read? I, yes, I, but uh, I, hunting I didn't care for. I used to have to do it. We uh, had a, we were in the mountains and there was a uh, corn planted and my, one of my jobs was before school, I had to take this old sh shotgun out and go shoot squirrels before they ate up the new planted corn. Mm -hmm. So you were, uh, you were definitely a farm boy. You grew up on the farm. I grew up on a farm. Uh -huh. Uh, but my father was a doctor. Mm -hmm. Did you have any intentions of uh, becoming a doctor yourself? Uh, up to a point, yes. But uh, when I was about, I just finished high school and we came to Los Angeles, my father had eye trouble. Mm -hmm. And he uh, came out here to see a specialist. And after staying about six months, the specialist told him that there's nothing he could do for his eyes. Mm -hmm. and that was it. It was he was going blind gradually. So Dad said, "I'd like you to be a doctor," but he said, "I, under these circumstances, I just can't afford to send you to medical school." So I said, "All right, we'll try something else." Yeah. So I stayed in Hollywood, and I lived with a great uncle named Fleming, and uh, Dad and Mother went back home. So finally, this uncle said, well, son, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I, I have no idea. He said, well, I have a friend that has a, is the manager of the studio just across the street here from my house. Maybe he'll have a job for you. So I said, all right. So we went over and so I'm gonna, he told the fellow, he said, this is my, one of my nephews. He said, would you uh, have a job for him? So the fellow was, said, yes, I might have a job as an assistant cameraman. <laughs> I said, fine, that's it. And the salary was uh, oh, the whole big sum of $10 a week. <laughs> and that meant seven days and nights if they wanted you that often. So I went to work there. It was the, oh, Charlie Ray had decided to go out on his own after being a comic and make a, a serious picture called, uh, oh, I've forgotten the name, anyway. Courtship of Miles Stanley. Yes, right. So we started the picture and we worked for about uh, six or eight months and uh, Finally, just before Christmas time, they said, uh, that's it, no more money. So I was fired, or laid off, everybody was for that matter. And uh, that was my introduction to pictures. So after that, I went, I, uh, went down and I got a bank, uh, bank uh, job as a bank messenger and I worked uh, I think I was making about uh, $75 a month. And one day I was wandering around, Sunday I think, I was wandering around Hollywood and I saw one of the cameramen that had been on Miles Standish and he asked what I was doing and I told him. He said, well, how would you like to be my assistant? And I said, fine. But I'll have to give him notice down at the bank. He said, all right, when you get, give him notice, come out and see me. <coughs> so about, uh, oh, I gave him a week's notice, and I, I went out and I saw G George Min was his name. And he said, all right, come on, you can be my assistant. You can get, I'll get you $25 a week. And I thought, well, that's, that's all right. So I went to work there, and then uh, I went after that, uh, George Schneiderman like he'd see me around there and he asked about you know if I'd like to work with him and I said sure because he was the head one of the head cameramen there at the time so I went to work with George Schneiderman and I think our first picture together was uh, wasn't the Iron Horse was it 
the Iron Horse. You you know all these things before I can think of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was it. No. What do you remember about that picture, picture in particular? What do I remember? Well, some of the hardships we went through. One was uh, we were living in a, it was in the wintertime. We were working up near Lake Winnemucca, I believe, and uh, cold and snow. But to save money, the company had rented the Algae Barn Circus Train, which was never meant for winter travel or anything else, mm -hmm. to house the people. So they came up, and they were those the big shots were living in the Algae Barn's train. The camera crew, George decided we didn't want to be too much with them, so we built our own little shack, which was part of the set. Actually, the, one of the sets, a little, you know, piece away from the train. Mm -hmm. And we lived in that. So, uh, got a little prompting, I don't know what I'm going to say next. Okay, so... Except that... Uh, were, were you... Uh, you worked then with George on on that picture as an assistant? Yes. And uh, that was with John Ford? John Ford. Mm -hmm. There was... So, had John Ford become a character by that time? John Ford was always, ever since I knew him, was a character. <laughs> He'd sit in his chair and chew a dirty old handkerchief with one... <coughs> with his pipe in one corner of his mouth and his handkerchief in the other. Mm -hmm. So one day, I had, I'd, I'd had to get bring some extra film over about from where we their last setup had been. And uh, I was trudging through the snow, and I heard, just as, as I was arriving there, I heard Ford say, say to George, where is that... Jewish brat of yours with a film. So I set the film case down and grabbed this big slate and I walked around in front of his chair and I said, don't you call me a Jewish brat. I'll break your goddamn skull. Well, he just <laughs> didn't say anything. And George says, now come down. Everything will be all right. Mm -hmm. So we, I guess that's about enough of the Iron Horse. He, he was uh, you worked with him several times then. Uh, you worked also on The Informer. Oh, yeah. Well, that was much later. Uh, were you an operator by that time? I was an operator, yes. And who was the... Uh, uh, jo Joe August was Joe August was the director, yes. Uh, uh, was he... He uh, bullied performances out of people, didn't he, John Ford? He was yes, in a way. Uh, one of the scenes where he had... Uh, uh, Bick uh, McLaughlin had to be drunk to play a scene. Mm -hmm. So John told him, he says, here's a bottle of, he knew Vic liked to drink, so he said, we aren't ready for you. Take this bottle and go up to your dressing room and we'll call you when we're ready. Mm -hmm. So after he gave him time enough to get pretty drunk, he called him down on the set <coughs> and uh, said to me, just Wherever he goes, keep the camera on him. Don't worry. And I said, all right. So he came down, and he was was he was drunk by that time. And he grabbed this poor girl whose name I don't remember, and started to you know hug her and kiss her, and she was actually frightened, I think. This was John Ford. No, oh, that was uh, oh, uh, McLaughlin. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, um, why he was a very, very fine director. He was very successful at what he did. What uh, being on the set and watching him work, what would you say made him successful? Well, in my opinion, it was his uh, he, his tightness of directing. He didn't waste uh, time with a lot of words and all that sort of thing. He just. <coughs> Excuse me. They, uh, they used to. The cutters used to say, "All you have to do is cut the slates off of his film, and you've got you put it together. You don't need, mm -hmm. you know." What did uh, you worked with George Schneiderman and, and uh, uh, Fax and Dean and some, uh, several other uh, directors of photography as an assistant? What did they expect out of you as an assistant? 
Well, uh, just did I do my work, I guess. Were they very uh, tough with you, or were No, they? no. Uh, Fax and Dean, uh, but on the Iron Horse, we'd, we'd experimented a little with light with filters. Right. So uh, later, when uh, they were making a picture down in the desert, they wanted some uh, dark skies and all mm -hmm. with filters. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Cut it off. They wanted someone who knew something about, you know, could make the d skies dark and all that for these camels going over the uh, sand dunes and that sort of thing. Yes. So Faxon said, yes, he knew how to do that. So we went, he went, I took me as his assistant and we went down and uh, worked with uh, this outfit in the desert. In the sand dunes near Yuma, and uh, when it, uh, they would do all uh, a lot of the stuff around the fort and all, but if they wanted long shots where they wanted a dark sky and a lot of camels silhouetted going across, they'd call it for fax and his camera. So he and I would go out and set up and maybe wait for a certain you know all day and never do one shot. But, uh, hey, he was just a special cameraman on that project. On that, on that project, he was. What yeah. picture was that? Do you recall? Bo Jest. Bo Jest. Mm -hmm. Was that the uh, silent version? That was the original version. Uh, yeah, first one. Um, what was it like working in film in those days as a as a crew member? Was it uh, was a real camaraderie? Uh, yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. did, how did that change uh, over the years? Or did it change? Well, see, I've been gone now for over ten years. Uh -huh. But I mean, so up until then, it was it was still pretty much the same. Uh huh. Um, now, I, I'm trying to what I'm trying to get at, at asking you what they expected of you as an assistant is I'm trying to find out what then you expect <coughs> of your assistants later on, in having had the experience of being an assistant. Well, I uh, I expected them to be on the job and be able to uh, have whatever equipment we needed. Mm -hmm. For instance, we were uh, doing a, uh, we started Bonnie and Clyde. Mm -hmm. We had a location down near Dallas, Texas. And uh, this was a strange assistant because my other assistant had now become an operator and I was no longer available. So I took this assistant along, and he was he was he was good. He was all right. Except uh, you expect when you go on location that you, he has whatever equipment you need, you know. So it came one day when we were doing a, a, the picnic scene in the picture. Yes. And uh, the director asked for he wanted us kind of a, to mix up with all this. Uh, killing and all that sort of thing. He wanted to make it kind of soft and, you know, poetic-like. So I asked my assistant if he'd bring out the fog filters. So he went in the equipment truck and stayed, it seemed like a long time. He came back, says, I don't have any. I didn't bring them. Mm. Says, oh. So, what the hell I do? I said, have you got some optical flats? He said, yes, I have optical glass. I said, well, come on, we'll fix something. So I went in, got a jar of Vaseline, and I made my own mm -hmm. fog filters, rubbed Vaseline all over. And that's how we shot. Uh -huh. We got, it was, it was pretty good effect. Yes, it was. Um, let's, let's wait. Uh, so, uh, uh, aside from Joe August, who did you operate for? Uh, principally Joe, but uh, Johnny Mescal was one of one of uh, one of my mentors. As a matter of fact, I think I learned more about photography from Johnny than any other cameraman I worked with. What did you learn from him? Simplicity is a, what? Did, how did he say it? Don't use three cat three 
lights if you could do it all with one. Mm -hmm. And it worked pretty good. Mm -hmm. One night, I remember we were doing the picture at Universal. I don't know the name, but the scene entailed uh, a bunch of slaves going up a, a, a stairs or ramp mm -hmm. with uh, big shadows. They wanted big shadows of these, you know. And the assistant director thought, well, it's about dinner time, we, so we don't have meal penalty and all. We better co go to dinner. So we went to dinner, and then we came back. And Johnny told his gaffer, he said, put a sun arc right, right here, right on the floor. And he put it there. He said, light it. He said, OK, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> and this is assistant director who would have been afraid it would take two or three hours, and we'd go into meal penalty was flabbergasted, but we made the shot, and it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. One light, laying low on the floor with these big shadows of these slaves mm -hmm. walk going up upstairs. So that was his idea. He was, uh, unfortunately, alcohol got the best of him. As it did with a lot of people. Yeah. Well, uh, Johnny, I... My house, where I lived, was between Universal and her, Johnny's house, which is Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joe, Mc, one of my jobs was to deliver Johnny sober to the studio and get him back home at night. Mm -hmm. So I'd bring him home. He'd bring me to my house, let me off. And just for fun, I watched he'd go down just two blocks. And in turning where he should have to go home, he went the other way, and I knew exactly where he was going. He was going to a bar up on Melrose Avenue. Mm. So I'd jump in my car and go up there and get him out, get him home. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that uh, alcohol took the best of our cameramen with them? I mean, there were some great cameramen that really were destroyed by alcohol. Well, <laughs> I can't answer that question. Was it the pressure of the job? Or? Oh, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I, I, I never found it. After I became a director of photography, I didn't find that much pressure. Mm -hmm. um, you worked on a foreign correspondent as yes. a camera operator? Yes. Uh, do you recall working on the, the sequence in the windmill? Um, where they're they're trying Joe was it Robert well, who was the star of that? I can't remember who the star was uh, mm, Joel yeah. McRae Joel yes uh, where Joel McRae is trying to hide from the uh, the Nazis and uh, I remember the windmill but I uh, the sequence you mentioned I don't mm -hmm. mostly what I remember about is the storm the plane at sea oh, yes. you know uh, were you involved in that process shot where the, the plane comes crashing down? Where it comes in and the water engulfs the plane, comes... Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Breaks through the screen, the water uh, uh, opened up the screen and the water <laughs> came into the plane? That yeah, was yeah, mm-hmm. Was that, uh, oh, do you, can you comment on that at all? Do you re recall something about that specifically? No, nothing particularly. Uh-huh. Just another day. Another day. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, now, uh, who made you a first cameraman? Uh, a man at Columbia Pictures, Columbia Studios. Uh, he was, uh, oh, I can't remember his name, but he was head of the head of the laboratory and also hired, had, you know, hired cameramen. Mm -hmm. Well, uh... That's all right. We, we can look that up. I forgot how it came about exactly, except that he, uh, uh, Rudy Matei, when mm -hmm. we were over there, he said he wanted, you know, he, I'd been with him for quite a while. And he says, well, why don't you be a car first cameraman? I said, I'd love to. <coughs> he said, well, I'll go up and talk to the man. 
So he went up to the head of the laboratory, really hired the, or, you know, hired the cameraman. It wasn't the head of the camera department, actually. Mm -hmm. So I went up to see him, and he says, uh, I uh, don't have anything right away, but maybe in a week or so, I might have a job for you. He said, fine. So I spent the next week or whatever it was, and uh, I was watch. I went on the different men's set and watched how they worked. I I envied Joe Walker how he photographed women, mm -hmm. and I was I watched him as much as I could. But pretty soon this this fella called me up, <coughs> and uh, said we got a job for you to start next week. I said. All right. So I rummaged around and got a crew together, my gaffer and my grip, head grip and all. And we went to work and did this picture with uh, Arthur Lake and I uh, forget who else. Oh, uh, Shelley Winters. Mm -hmm. What was the picture? I think, I don't not positive, but I think it was Sailor's Holiday or something like that. Yes, uh, William Burke was the uh, director. Yeah. So that was my first picture. Uh-huh. Now, after that, uh, this, uh, the fellow that was kind of in charge of contracts called me up and said he'd like to sign me for a contract. Mm-hmm. Which, of course, no, I couldn't ask for more than minimum salary, the union salary, but this old fella was name only, in name only, at the head of the camera department, says, do one thing, be sure. <coughs> Excuse me. If you sign a contract, have it in there that nothing, you're not, don't have to do anything no picture, which the uh, principal photography is less than 10 days. Because mm -hmm. in those days, they used to make five and six day westerns, yes. you know. I said, all right. So actually, it was, they put it in the contract that way. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to do any of those five day westerns and all mm -hmm. that that they were making. But you still did get involved with B pictures. You were, you oh, there were a lot of B pictures in Columbia, uh -huh. but uh, none of them were that short. I mean, you know. Yes. But how did that help you? It must have helped you a great deal. Uh, it prepared you later on as a director of photography. Uh, what, uh, what in particular do you think uh, helped you? To well, it, did, uh, it helped me from breaking my back, making uh, Western in the five days. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to make the western, but did you? Uh, uh, do you think that you'd been working on A pictures at uh, other studios and also at Columbia well, as not, an operator? Oh, as an operator. And yeah. uh, then, then you were now making B pictures as a director of photography, but not the real low five-day quickie western. No. How did that uh, drop down in the in the, the budget of the pictures? How did that help you as a director of photography? Did you? Were you prepared for it as an operator and as an assistant? Had had those two jobs prepared you for becoming the director of photography? I, I think so, by using Johnny Muscal's standard, simplicity, mm -hmm. yes. and then watching Joe Walker, what he could do with a woman. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thought I was prepared. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, Let's let me ask you about the informer just for a moment. Let's step back. Uh, do you recall uh, the difficulty, or if it was difficult uh, to light that? That was basically a totally interior picture, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Uh, was that a difficult picture to photograph? Uh, well, not really, because uh, Joe August was a very good cameraman. Mm -hmm. And we, what we did, we had a stage all to ourselves, which we used to go in in the morning, and they'd fill it with uh, fog, mm -hmm. you know, made with new jaw and that. <clears throat> and it stayed that way 
to the uh, until noon, and then they'd let it air out. You'd come back and you'd do it again, and then it stayed that way the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. Was it? Uh, I know this may sound like a silly question, but was it difficult to sustain that that mood? <laughs> Fog is is difficult to photograph anyway. Yeah. I don't think so because, they, as I say, they just filled the stage and men kept feeding it in, special effects men, as we needed it, mm -hmm. so it would stay about the same. You, you said that you followed uh, John Mescal's uh, style of photography in that you like to keep it simple. Uh, how else would you describe your photography, your, your approach to photography? I don't have any words for that. I don't know how you would... You were one of the, the few directors of photography that uh, consistently crossed, crossed over from commercials to uh, features. Uh, was that because of your contract at Columbia? Uh, no, at that time I wasn't under contract. Uh -huh. I was freelancing. Did, uh, commercials, uh, did that, that help you as a director of photography to, to try new things? Uh, uh, somewhat, but also uh, financially pretty good because uh, the outfit I worked for, my usual salary uh, was, would be, was, was say, was, I think it was $400 a day because a commercial might take one day, two days, mm -hmm. whatever, three days. So the girls in the office knew that. And when they called me for a job, they'd say, uh, and they knew they didn't have to ask, they'd say, uh, Bernie, what is your salary? Well, the minute they said that, that was a cue. I knew that they were making a, a commercial on a cost plus basis. Mm -hmm. So the more that it cost to make, the more they got. And so I just, you know, just boosted my salary a couple of hundred dollars a day. <laughs> Worked out fine. Uh -huh. Um, as we were, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> going to uh, do a Chevrolet commercial mm -hmm. in Honolulu. It was among the pineapple fields and all that. And they told me, they gave me this same uh, story, and I realized it, so I automatically boosted my salary. And instead of a one or two day job, we had about two weeks of very nice work in Honolulu mm -hmm. among the pineapple fields and all that with Chevrolet automobiles running all over. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your first break really as a director of photography? What brought you from doing the, uh, uh, the middle pictures or the, uh, the B pictures to the A pictures? I would say, uh, uh, all the King's Men, mm -hmm. you were doing, in my opinion. Uh -huh. What about that picture do you feel uh, lifted you from the bees? I can't answer that. That's just how a uh, different uh, producer that wants your services later, how they, mm -hmm. what they think of it, I it guess. It was a very successful film. Yeah. And Broderick Crawford, uh, Right. won an Academy Award for it. Yes. Uh, it's too bad you weren't nominated because that was very, very fine cinematography. Um, well. It was low, there were, there was, uh, it appeared to be there were a great number of location uh, shots in that picture. Practically all of it was locations. Mm -hmm. Not all, but most all. So the, up around Stockton and Sacramento mm -hmm. in that area. So the B pictures helped you in that you weren't generally with a B picture studio bound because you couldn't afford the, the cost of construction. And so possibly that helped you later on to, uh, uh, to be able to shoot in locations quickly. Maybe. Might have had something to do with it. Uh-huh. Um, you, you really did. A after All the King's Men, or right b actually before All the King's Men, you began to work with uh, Nicholas Ray and Humphrey Bogart and, and mm -hmm. uh, doing some pictures with some 
some major stars and uh, with some some directors that ultimately became major directors John Sturgis and, yeah uh, uh, I'd like to ask you some questions about uh, about those directors and uh, the difference in their working relationships with you so that we could try to define what what makes a good director cameraman relationship um, what was uh, how how did Sturgis like to work with you as a, a director well he would uh tell me what he wanted to see on the screen mm -hmm. and I would make suggestions how I thought best to do it mm -hmm. and if we agreed fine if we didn't we talked about it and came to a, 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 you know a, an understanding mm -hmm. how was that different from working with Nicholas Ray was how was your well, Nick, he, he was, it was very very fine as long as he laid off the soup uh -huh. when he got that in him, he got pretty bullheaded, and he wanted to do, you know, quite a few things. That uh, Robert Ro uh, Rawson. Rawson? I mm -hmm. thought he was a good director, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, the poor guy was diabetic. Oh, uh huh. Uh, you and <coughs> excuse me. You received your first Academy Award nomination in uh, Academy Award in 1953 for uh, From Here to Eternity. I think it's sitting right behind you there. Uh huh. Uh, uh, yeah. Could you recount some of the difficulties that you encountered in that picture? That was uh, no, nothing, nothing in particular that I can remember. You were shooting on location in Hawaii. It was yes, quite a lot of it was shot there. Uh huh. Out at Fort. Uh, we get the name of the fort. Fort. Well, whatever. The thing that's uh, that's important for our, a young man to understand, is if a fellow's just getting started in this business, is that you were you were dealing, trying to make a picture have the same kind of uh, look, not necessarily the same kind of look, but the same quality of look uh, on location as you were trying to do in a studio, and uh, you were doing it with the same studio kind of equipment. You were doing it with big cameras. Mm -hmm. With big lights, you didn't have the Panaflex cameras and all no. those small, nice little light things that you had today. Right. And uh, that must have caused some logistical problems just in and of itself. Not, not, not too much. Uh huh. Because uh, you, uh, you, you get together with your gaffer and your crew and decide what you think you'll need on location, mm -hmm. and it all goes there on uh, maybe on one boat or something and. Uh -huh. You have it there. How was your uh, relationship with Fred Zinneman? Uh, what Fred, mm -hmm. very nice. Yeah, Freddie was very nice. I enjoyed working with him. What about your relationship with him? Did you like? Well, I, I admired him the way he told off Bert Lancaster for one thing. Uh huh. Because Bert liked to, you know, kind of give butt in where it was director's job giving orders and things to do and Fred finally told him one day he said Bert look I'm directing the picture you just uh, do the acting okay mm -hmm. and from then on it was all right <laughs> well that must have been difficult because uh, Frank Sinatra was in that picture wasn't he? yes he was and he only he liked to do things in one take and you had other actors. well Frank was not so high and mighty in those days. Mm -hmm. If you happen to know the story that he was broke when he made a test, I made a test of two people for that part. He was one, and Eli Wallach was the other. Mm -hmm. And at the time, he was broke and over in Spain somewhere, living off his wife, Avis, whatever she made. Mm -hmm. But he borrowed enough money to come to Hollywood and make the test. And uh, we made, I made a test one afternoon and one in the morning of he and one with Eli Wallach. Mm -hmm. And uh, whoever did the deciding cone or the whoever decided on Sinatra. So that was it. Now he got started. At that moment, he was not doing well at all. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen the, the, the film The Godfather, but there, there have been a lot of people that have said that the horse's head incident is really sort of an incident that occurred on from here to eternity that 
Sinatra got his job on from here to eternity because uh, of threats from the mafia to Harry Cohn. Um, well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't know about mm. that. What was Harry Cohn like to, to work with? Well, he uh, I was I never had much contact with him. All the years I was there, there uh, he was a you know real what do you call a he man macho macho. That's yeah, that's the word. Mm -hmm. He didn't really cause you any problems with your photography. He didn't no. try to dictate anything to you. No. Uh, he, uh, I had very little contact with him. Mm -hmm. He was having some uh, trouble with one of the directors, mm -hmm. and I was the cameraman on the picture. And he called me up to his office. And he said, "Now, did so and did you hear so and so say so and so to that girl or whatever?" I said, "Mr. Cohn, I never heard a thing." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So out I go. That was all. Mm -hmm. What he wanted, he wanted. He was trying to get a court case uh, against this director. I don't know whether to break his contract or for what purpose. And he thought he could use some of his action on the s set mm -hmm. to do that. And he wanted, you know, whoever would say so to be an, a witness. Mm -hmm. I refused, and so he said, get out. So that was it. Um, what do you think of working at Columbia at, on, under contract? Do you feel that that was, uh, how was that different from working under contract, say, possibly at some of the other studios? Well, I don't know, because that's the only one I ever worked is under contract. Uh -huh. Other than that, I freelanced. Mm -hmm. Did you like the free? Excuse me. Okay. Um, uh, you worked again with Burt Lancaster uh, after From Here to Eternity on Birdman of Alcatraz. That's right. At this time, he was the producer, isn't that correct? No. Wasn't he? No. Oh, I thought he was. No. <laughs> no, he wasn't the producer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, uh, can't remember the name. That's all right. Um, I can't remember his name now. But that was a very, very well, well-made picture. And if someone had come to me with that picture and said, you're going to be photographing a great deal of the picture inside of one or several cells, small cells, I would have thought, how in the world are you going to sustain that for that length of time over the length of a feature? But it was done. Uh, John Frankenheimer and yourself really uh, sustained the, uh, the dramatic uh, tension in that picture. Well, uh, I had... Uh a little problem with John on uh, to start, uh, but to, in the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, we were supposed to be in these small cells, yeah. and uh, he's just from New York, mm -hmm. so he, I don't know where they get the ideas that they know all about camera lenses, but one one scene he said, Bernie, put a 25 millimeter on and give me a shot of. I said, uh, I said, John, I don't want to do that. Just why not? I said, it'll make it look too big. Well, that's what I want. So Bert was there, and he said, John, why, why don't why don't you just uh, direct the picture and uh, and shut up? <laughs> why don't you just direct the picture and let Bernie photograph it? So that kind of settled him down, and we got along all right after that. Well, it uh, it worked very well. I mean, there's a the sequence in the uh, the I don't know what they would call it, but the yard outside where where Burt Lancaster is walking around, and there's a uh, there's a sequence where he's in the rain and walking. And, uh huh. Uh, um, I know for you it's very difficult, or very easy because you've done this all your life. But how did you come up? come upon that style of photography for that piece, and uh, what were some of the... Did it have a style? I didn't notice. <laughs> well, it was a very stark, uh, realistic style of photography. Oh. Um, well, I, 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 don't, I don't recall anything particular that I did. You Unusual, were, I mean. And you didn't fill the shadows like some cameramen would have done. Today, they would have tried to go in there 
with a documentary approach and had very low light levels and and uh, but yours was a very stark blacks and whites and grays and, mm -hmm. and uh, but that was just uh, <coughs> nothing uh, abnormal for you huh? no mm -hmm. uh, you were nominated again for the harder they fall that's right uh, was there anything different about the photography in that picture that uh, would have caused it to be nominated well i thought it was a well done picture Mm -hmm. But it was uh, it uh, was nominated, but it did not get the Oscar, as you know. Yes. I forget what what beat me. It was another fight picture, I think. Mm -hmm. Who won it that year? I think Joe Ruttenberg. I believe. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, you became involved with William Castle. Yeah. Uh, did he actually direct his pictures, or was he more just a distributor? No, he, he, he directed them. Mm -hmm. What was his approach to, to directing? Uh, scare the hell out of people, <laughs> you know? Was he a, a fun man to work with? Yeah, he was fun. Very easy to work with? Yeah, he was a fine, good guy. Uh -huh. His idea was uh, like to uh, have uh, no lady coming, or this is never happened but just for instance mm -hmm. coming down the stairs in a wheelchair and her head would drop off and roll down you know in uh -huh. front of the camera <laughs> shock i guess is the word uh -huh. you'd like to use shock people um you worked on mr sardonicus with him i don't remember the name there were several but i don't mm -hmm. remember which one that was but the, the amazing thing is that you went from the from his pictures which i would assume were fairly low budget pictures right <coughs> right into a Birdman of uh, Alcatraz, which had an enormous amount of sets. Um, uh, were you, you were actually on location well, for some of that, weren't you? At, at uh, for his pictures, you mean? I uh, know, for uh, going from William Castle's pictures, which were low budgets, then to a big budget picture like Birdman well, of Alcatraz. Well, uh, at that time I was under contract at Columbia, and I did whatever they told me to do. Mm -hmm. So... Were you, uh, that was a... Uh, Birdman of Alcatraz was a for United Artist. Was that on loan out? Uh, did you? No. That was, well, it may have been for United Artists, but it was made at Columbia Pictures. Uh -huh. So they used the Columbia Studio. Oh, that's possible. Uh -huh. And I went along with the deal, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you were nominated for black and white photography for King Rat, which should have won yes, the photography. Yes, I, I, I thought that was pretty good, too. Mm -hmm. uh, that was... Uh, Brian, Brian Forbes is very good friend of mine. Uh -huh. <laughs> How was he to work with? He was great. I loved him. What in particular do you recall? Well, he was pleasant and he uh, he liked me and I liked him. It was mm -hmm. just one of those things we had good rapport uh -huh. and uh, it was fun working with him. That, that set was built out in uh, uh, Thousand Oaks, wasn't it? That's right. Um, it didn't look like Thousand Oaks. <laughs> It looked like you'd went on location, distant location. Well, that was uh, the intent, of course. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, what about that? George, George Siegel was, uh, I believe, was the main one in that. Uh -huh. What about the photography in that did you particularly like? I think, uh, going back to the Mescal theory, simplicity. Mm -hmm. The thing that interests me is you, you were now beginning to do both color and black and white. You were, mm. you were switching back and forth. Um, <coughs> were you principally lighting your color the way you were lighting your black and white, or were you... Uh, well, uh, yes. In a way, mm -hmm. there used to be an old ratio of... Uh, uh, Technicolor had must have four to one or three to one or whatever. Fill light must be three one third of. I I chose to ignore that. Uh huh. Um. Okay. Did you do uh, uh, how to succeed in business before Bonnie and Clyde or after Bonnie and Clyde? Before. Well, now, that's very interesting, because here you had a high-key picture. 
I mean, how the competing business going directly to um, a no-fill uh, kind of photography on Bonnie and Clyde. Well, when you say going directly, that's not true. There's a time lapse there, mm -hmm. quite a bit. But uh, the way I, I don't know, I did that. I had the entire set covered with the muslin mm -hmm. and lit with hanging lights up above mm -hmm. and dimmers, the switches where I could kill certain ones, and, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, what was his name, Dave, director? On, on which picture, David Swift? David Swift. Mm -hmm. We would uh, line up and make a shot. He'd give me the next setup, and uh, I push one little, little inky, just for a little modeling, mm -hmm. in with the camera. I'd say we're ready. <laughs> David said, "Bernie, you got to stop this. You're killing me. My bladder's killing me. I don't even have time to go to the bathroom." <laughs> but that's that's how it worked. It would, there was no mm -hmm. butts, and you just push one little lamp in to get just a slight bit of modeling and shot it, that's all. Mm -hmm. um, and then that was a totally different approach uh, than you did on Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, yeah, entirely. Uh, whose idea was it to do Bonnie and Clyde that way? Was it a combined effort on your part? In, Arthur in photography, you mean? Yes. Uh -huh. Mine. Mm -hmm. My idea. Did you have any resistance or find any resistance from the studio? Or? No. You were, again, you were principally on location, except for some cover shot, cover sets in Texas. Uh, we were in Texas most of the time. Mm -hmm. Some, uh, some, uh, not so much cover shots as process, but mm -hmm. uh, we had some process shots in the automobile. Mm -hmm. um, you were again working with, with BNCs, uh, with, uh, that was before the, uh, the new Roscoe or the new gelatin came out, that, uh, that you, the correcting filters on the lights that would uh, keep you from burning burning gel up quickly. There was, there's a new gelatin out that uh, you can put over a light like a 50, a correction to, oh. that will uh, will stay in the lamp for a long time and keep its color temperature. You were working with big lamps, trying to match interiors to exteriors, mm -hmm. where the interiors were 3200 degrees Kelvin, and your exteriors, of course, were daylight. Uh, how did you go about doing that? Uh, mostly with neutral filters, mm -hmm. neutrals on the windows if they were, you know. What, how, what would you do to correct your interiors, for the color temperature on the interior? Mm. Now you're making me think. I don't know if I shot for exterior or for interior. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Uh -huh. I recall... Um, many times that you'd be shooting out towards a door or something like that and people would be going in and out of doors mm -hmm. and uh, the thing that was remarkable about that as you look back on it today is you just you didn't have these small units the light units to uh, to make your job easy you were using fairly large units and you right. were dealing with a film stock that had a very fairly slow asa mm -hmm. and so you were uh, you were using nds i guess and also i guess correcting the exterior by putting 85s over everything yeah. Okay. Um, and what was? Uh, how did you and Arthur Penn uh, work out your arrangement? Uh, he's he's been noted for not particularly liking um, certain directors of photography. He's very vocal about it, but uh, apparently you worked very well with him. We got along fine. Mm -hmm. The only thing I uh, noticed from the beginning was that uh, his film editor, Edie, or what was her name? I don't know. She, well, I've forgotten, but she used to come down, their offices were in New York, mm -hmm. but she would come down to uh, Dallas every week, and we'd run a whole week's rushes, and she, she did most of the choosing. She didn't, author didn't have too much to say about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, again. And she should have got an Oscar, <laughs> except that she happened to be on the East Coast, and the I see. film editors in Hollywood would not 
even nominate her. Mm. Well, now, our, that wasn't, I don't think that was Arthur Penn's first picture, but it was one, no. of, his, one of his early pictures. And again, you were assigned to work with uh, a, a first-time director, Gordon uh, Parks, on The Learning Tree. Uh, right. And that was very well photographed. Uh, he was a first-time director, but was necessarily a first-time photographer. because Oh, he was, he was so a celebrated still photographer for, you, for Life magazine. How did you work together on that? Great, great. Did he try to get involved in the photography? No, no, not, 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 not whatsoever. Mm -hmm. He just expressed a certain he, feel? No uh, problem with him at all. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he brought a lot of his cameras with him in his bag when we came down to where it was, Kansas, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. He threw them aside. He said, the hell with that. I'm not going to use these anymore. Mm -hmm. He said, Bernie's going to do the photography. Uh -huh. um, how did that project come about for you? Or did he choose you for the picture? You know, I, I don't know. Uh -huh. I really don't know. It, why, it, it amazed me that you chose to re retire in the early 70s. You were still in your prime. I mean, <coughs> you were doing very, very fine work. Yeah, but I was uh, 65, mm -hmm. and I was able to retire with a small pension, and I'd had enough of Hollywood. I said, I'm getting out of here. And about a year or so before, about a year before I retired, we bought this place. Mm -hmm. Why had you had it with Hollywood? What had changed? Oh, too many things to mention even. I, don't, I can't even tell you. I was just fed up. Uh -huh. I was tired of working. I'd been doing it for 50 years. Yes. And I thought that was long enough. I would say so. <laughs> Although a lot of your contemporaries uh, work until they uh, drop on the stage. Yeah, well, you see, I've had about 10 good, nice years mm -hmm. right here, retired, and uh, I didn't drop on the stage. Uh -huh. <coughs> um, what has been your basic philosophical point of view about photography? How have you gone about your work? Uh, you say keep it simple, but... Uh, now that was, I learned that from Johnny Mescal. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you use an exposure meter uh, in your work? Yes. Did you read f-stops or foot candles? Uh, it, it depended. If you're outside, you read f-stops. Inside, you'd read foot candles. Mm -hmm. And you, you... I had a, I had a half a dozen meters. Mm -hmm. I gave them all to the, the branch of photography branch over here at the university. Uh-huh. Uh, do you feel that... Um, when you have a natural key on a set like that, uh, a practical, like the, the one over to your left, that you should key from that, or do you key wherever where, you... Where it's practical, yes. Uh, where it's, yes, I try. Even unless maybe I was trying to make some girl look glamorous, and then I put it where I thought <coughs> it made her look best. Uh-huh. Okay. I want to ask you some technical questions now. Oh, that, that'll be dangerous, huh? No, not dangerous. Probably no answers. Oh, okay. Uh, what do you look for in hiring a gaffer? What, what, do, you, what do you try to find? I, I try to find uh, someone that's congenial, first of all, mm -hmm. and knows how to uh, handle his men, mm -hmm. and then I can depend on to do certain things that you do in a set before you go in, how getting it ready. How specific do you get with a gaffer in discussing a setup? Do you tell him that you want a 2K, or you just say you want a light? Or? Well, I, I don't tell him the size lamp. I assume that he knows what size lamp to use. I'd say, we need a light right over here, we mm -hmm. need to over wherever, and give me a backlight from up there and there. Mm -hmm. And if you can make a pattern of that window on the background, it'll be nice. Mm -hmm. And then I sit down and let him do it. Do you, do you discuss foot candle uh, levels or do they no or? no they, he knows after <coughs> he knows after two days what what you know how much light you need uh -huh. um, what has been your 
how do you deal with a production manager, especially one that's that's trying to push you? I stay away from it as much as possible. Uh -huh. um, how important is it for the director of photography to uh, participate in pre-production planning? I think it's very important to get ideas what the director wants, what the producer wants, the idea of what the picture's about, and try to get the feel of what it, you know, how, and then study about it and think of how you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a big a big budget luxury, or is it absolutely necessary for low budget pictures as well? Uh, I, do, I, I think it was, it was normal on the pictures I worked on, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that the director of photography should get involved in answer print timing and uh, get involved with the lab? Uh, up to a point. I think they should uh, uh, see the answer print, and I think they should, with a representative of the lab, and discuss, you know, what his ideas are. Uh -huh. For instance, run the whole shebang and can make notes of what you think should be done and this and that. Uh huh. Which format do you prefer working in, uh, 185 or anamorphic? <laughs> it's hard to say. I worked in 185 for so long, and then it came anamorphic. I, 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 I don't know. I don't think there's any difference, really. Uh -huh. Except uh, you look through one of those anamorphic things, it drives you crazy. <laughs> Sure does. Um, as a director of photography, you're not only an artist but a commander of men. What has been your approach in leading Say, the group? You're quite flattering there about. What, what's, ask, ask me that again. Okay. As a director of photography, you are not only an artist but a commander of men. How do you try to uh, lead your crew? What's your psychology? My psychology is to keep them happy. Mm -hmm and make them like you, and then they'll work their tail off uh -huh. for somebody they like, where if they don't like you, they won't, they, you know, they can... They'll try to destroy you. No, not necessarily, but they can just slough off little things and mm -hmm. <coughs> take more time and that sort of thing, if, the, if you know, if they're so inclined. Uh -huh. What do you like most about cinematography? That I'm through with it. Uh-huh. There's some pain there. Is it any reason that the, it's a painful thing? No, no. You just I did it for about 50 years, so I thought that was long enough. Uh huh. Uh, what advice would you give to uh, young directors in how they should work with directors of photography? Well, that would be rather. <laughs> I don't think I'm fit to give any advice to anyone. How about? Uh, directors of photography just getting started. Again, I don't think I could give any advice. I think each man has to do what he feels, whatever makes him happy, if that's possible. What does it take to be a successful director of photography? Uh, why don't you ask someone that's been successful? Oh, I think he's been very successful. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, okay. I, I, anything else that you can think of? Anything that, humorous or anything that's occurred in your career that you'd, you'd like to recount? Mm, well, there might be a few things, but uh, one, one would be what you call being buried under elephants. Buried under elephants? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were doing a picture called Clive of India. Mm -hmm. And in the back lot at Golden Studio, they'd built this thing that looked like whatever India looks like. So uh, part of the scenes were that these elephants come charging, you know, mm -hmm. something off screen. So my, my camera, I was an operator then. I was, they dug a pit about, oh, six by, five, five or six feet, like a big grave. Mm -hmm. I put myself and my camera in there with a little s s 
slit so I could shoot, and I wanted shots of these elephants coming over, right over top of the camera. Uh-huh. So we made the first take, and they came over and asked me how it was. I said, I don't think it's what you want. They all come up and went to either side. They didn't go over the camera. Well, I was wondering why. Well, I said, elephants have a keen sense of smell, and if they smell something there, they're not going to go over it. They're going to go around it, mm -hmm. which is what I don't think you want. So they thought of an idea. They'd do it again, and on each, just out of my camera range, they'd do it just for my camera. They would station these men. They would force these elephants to, you know, to converge and come over. <coughs> So they started, started the camera, everything started. Here come these elephants. Well, they, they, instead of running into these men or whoever were on just out of my vision, or the camera's vision, they had to go over the camera. But nobody had thought to how much an elephant weighed, or you know, how much timber it would take. Well, at least uh, the things that the cover was over them was two by, Twelve. Mm -hmm. Well, here came these elephants, and the first big one stepped on these plank, and I heard the damn thing crack. I said, uh-oh, here goes Bernie, buried right under in <laughs> Goldwyn's back lot underneath a, an elephant. Because nobody, I guess, thought to figure how much, you know, they, they weighed or how much these planks would hold. But it, uh, I'm still here, so I guess it, it worked. <laughs> And I got the shot they wanted. Uh huh. Well, that, uh, if you had too many of those experiences, I can imagine wanting to retire after 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a similar one earlier, but it was not a matter of uh, weight. It was just dirt and what have you. In the Iron Horse, uh, yeah. Was the Iron Horse? Mm hmm. Snyderman, Ford, and myself got in this pit. And uh, here, these uh, horses, they had this charge of a bunch of, I know, I guess they were Indians come charging. They wanted to go over the camera. Mm -hmm. So uh, they started, gave the order, and here we turned the camera on, and here came all these horses charging right over. And uh, no, no planks broke, but the dirt flew in, got in the lens, got in my eyes, got in everybody's. Mm -hmm. And they uncovered us, and we, I, I think, probably somewhere on the walls at the ASC, there's a picture of the three of us, <laughs> Snyderman and Ford and myself, mm -hmm. in this pit with dirt all over us. What do you think made Joe August uh, and George Snyderman and fellows like that successful and, and uh, very good at what they did? What was their key to success? I'm trying to think, analyze it. I, I really don't know. Uh -huh. Well, I know that the Snyderman uh, had owned half the uh, Fox Laboratory, and he could uh, pick his own jobs and all. That helped. Joe August, I, I don't know how to... He was just good. Mm -hmm. uh, what What are your hobbies? What did you enjoy? Uh, have you enjoyed doing with your life? Hobbies. Hmm. Well, I used to like to play a little golf that we have here, which I can't do anymore. With my bum knees. Crossword puzzles. I like to do crossword puzzles. Uh huh. Uh, nothing outstanding that I can think of. Mm -hmm. Do you have any grandchildren? Slews of them. Pic if you look over there, you'll see a bunch of pictures that I don't even know how many now. Well, that's not a hobby. That's a full-time profession. Well, yeah. that, I, that's out of my hands, though. That's <laughs> two generations, you know. Uh -huh. I had two daughters, and from then on, that's that. That's their job. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we've done it. We've done it. Good. Yes.
Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir.